Hello Twitch and welcome back to our coverage from the AWS Summit here in New York, in the east coast of the US today. Uh, AWS Summits are developer events for customers of Amazon Web Services, which is the cloud computing unit uh, within Amazon. Uh, we're continuing our coverage here and I'm joined by a couple of special guests from one of our service teams here at AWS, the teams that create the services that our customers use. So let me ask you to introduce yourselves first of all. Let's start with you, Chris, if we can. Hi, my name's Chris Munns. I'm a senior developer advocate focused on serverless technologies here at AWS, based here in New York City. Great. Uh, my name is Dougal Ballantyne. I'm the principal product manager for Amazon API Gateway, based in Seattle. Great. Now, I think a lot of people watching on the stream this afternoon are probably new to AWS, so and new to the terminology that you just sure. used. So I think the first thing we should do is start at the ground floor. Maybe you can describe to our viewers uh, what an API gateway is and what kind of role it plays for, for customers that choose to use that particular service. Yeah, no, that, no, no problem at all. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go one step further and go, what is an API? And okay. why would you have an API? And then we'll talk about what API gateway can do for you. So an API is an application programming interface. It effectively enables you a way to build a contract so that you can have clients, web clients, mobile apps, make calls to services you define. Yep. And Amazon API Gateway enables you to easily build and deploy those APIs and then operate them at scale. So you can easily deploy them up into AWS and then operate them with lots of different configurations with things like authorization and throttling and transformations and we'll get too deep too quickly for the <laughs> intro part. Great. Good stuff. And the reason that you joined us on Twitch today, of course, is you've got some uh, service announcements, recent service announcements that you want to talk about. I think these fall into two categories. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you to do is just walk us through uh, recent enhancements that have been made to the Amazon API Gateway service, maybe just spending a couple of minutes talking about uh, why these features were created, so what kind of problems they solve for customers, and then what the features are that we've recently announced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think the biggest, most exciting thing that we've announced the last couple of weeks is uh, something called private endpoints for API Gateway. So API Gateway, since it first launched here actually at the New York Summit a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, when initially launched had a concept called edge endpoints. These were endpoints that were represented by a CloudFront distribution. A little while later, we announced something called regional endpoints, which were endpoints that were publicly available inside of an AWS region yep. uh, without a CDN in front of it. And then just a couple weeks ago, private endpoints actually brings the API Gateway interface for your API completely into your VPC, your virtual private cloud. And so what's really exciting about this is as we see companies building APIs, specifically internal API-based services, yep. active in things like microservices, uh, being able to build an API-based service with API Gateway inside of your VPC just gives you a ton of capabilities as a developer. And API Gateway is packed with a lot of capabilities, things uh, just directly interfacing your API, like transformations and being able to do mappings back to different backends, but also the ability to do things like create client SDKs, to create Swagger templates, uh, to generate things like documentation. And so being able to apply all of those capabilities and make use of them inside of your VPC is super, super powerful, and it's just going to allow companies to do really exciting stuff with APIs. So what kind of uh, use cases or usage scenarios does a private API gateway endpoint lend itself to, which a regional or distributed one does not? You know, which yeah. kind of customers are most likely to use this specific feature? Absolutely. So we see this concept of uh, companies where they're building APIs outward facing to say mobile applications, yeah. public facing web pages, but then when it comes to their own internal technologies, tools, services, being able to privately host them inside of that VPC without the path can be exposed externally uh, provides, again, a number of benefits in terms of the security aspects. Yeah. So this is in, into service communication inside the security exactly. boundary, right? So you mentioned yeah. microservices, I think, when you were talking a little yeah. bit earlier. So is that a common use case? Is this a mechanism for customers to expose interfaces yeah. for the different component services that comprise their yeah. app? Is that how they use it? Well, well uh, so what we see typically is customers are building about 10 times more private APIs mm -hmm. than public APIs. So if you were building, for example, uh, a travel booking mobile app where you can go in and book things in the, the app. That is actually made up of APIs behind that. There's not just one service behind it. It's usually a collection of services. And while those are all secured so they understand who's calling them, they don't necessarily want to have them as a public yep. endpoint. And so being able to have a private endpoint enables them to spread those out. The other thing about private endpoints is it connects all the way through Amazon Direct Connect. 
And so corporations or companies who've connected their VPC back to their corporate data center have access to all those private endpoints as well. So they can traverse from their network back into AWS. Or the other way, right? Yep. From yep. AWS back into their network to proxy yeah. and gateway mm -hmm. services that might still yep. be outside of AWS. Yeah, so that's actually yep. another feature that we launched a few months ago called private integrations, where we can actually connect to resources all the way back in your data center and put a public interface on that where you get rate limiting and authorization, yep. but the resources live in your data center. Great. Any other features beyond private endpoints that you want to talk uh, about? Or do you have a demo of private endpoints <laughs> yeah. to show us? Well, actually, just recently, last couple of days, we also increased the default limits for API Gateway. Uh, customers, as, as Google was saying, are creating more and more APIs. Yeah. And actually, what we see is I like to think of it as a, the iceberg. You've got public APIs, just the tip of that iceberg. And then below the waterline are all those private APIs. And so, yeah. increasing default limits. Uh, there were some other changes just earlier well, last on, week. On the default limits, we actually intentionally designed them in the way we see customers are using them. So we've increased it to 120 of the edge optimized, which are very yep. obviously for mobile apps. 600 regional and 600 private. Okay. And, and so the scale is intentional for customers who are building those big microservices. And are those soft limits or hard limits? Can those are hard in? limits okay. today. Um, and, and we think that it's going to give a lot of customers space to grow into that, yep. that environment. Um, we also launched last week, I think, a really, really exciting feature called request response mapping overrides. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> but effectively what it enables you to do is to write some simple templating language in API Gateway to say when this response comes back from the back end, I want you to manipulate it and send it back different to the client. Okay. And the use case for this is actually for customers who have old backends. So one of our customers, a healthcare provider, they have a large backend, it's a legacy system, and when they make a call to it, it responds with an HTTP 200, which is a success, but in the message it says record not found. And they're building a modern healthcare application, so they actually want to turn that response around into a 400 and say record not found, yep. Yep. so that the mobile app that they've built actually is, is modern and, and reflective. This, does this use the same templating language that we use for uh, service proxies, that velocity templating language. It's velocity, the, yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. for the yep. velocity templates. Yep. So if we can here, you go to a little bit of a demo of just how easy it is to create private API Gateway endpoints. OK, And cool. so I'm already here in the API Gateway console. Uh, when you go to the API Gateway console, you can just go to Create API. And we actually provide a number of example APIs that you can just base yourself off of. So I'm going to come down here and uh, start with this example API. I'm going to select endpoint type of private and I'm going to click Import. Hey, Chris, while you're doing that, there's something on the console I want to highlight, which is a VPC endpoint, because we find our customers are looking for a high level of security, by default requires a resource policy. So when you create it, it's not accessible to everything in your VPC out of the box. You actually need to explicitly say, I want this private API for this VPC. OK. Yep. And in line with that, I actually now have to configure my resource policy to allow access inside of my VPC. Now, much like all good cooking shows, I've cheated a little <laughs> bit. I, I put the raw you know, cake in the top oven. Out of the bottom oven, I'm going to pull out the uh, Is this already, one you baked earlier? Yeah, the already okay. configured VPC endpoint. So there's two aspects to this, uh, this feature, really. One is the marking your API gateway as private. The second is creating a, a VPC endpoint inside of your VPC for this service bit too much to go into right here. But basically what I'm going to do now is now mark this VPC resource policy saying that this endpoint is going to allow to have access to it. Again, increasing the security aspects of my API. So I've gone and I've saved that. And now I just need to come back here to the resources and redeploy this API. I'm going to create a new stage called stage pride. And we'll just go ahead and deploy this. So while that's deploying, Chris, I noticed that you were in the resource policy section. And so maybe once we're done with this, we can talk a little bit about what other things a resource policy can do, because it's another thing mm. we launched as part yeah. of this. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that right now, actually. So yeah. So at the bottom, you can see it gives some examples. Uh, and so the ability to whitelist an AWS account, the ability to do IP address restrictions. So you can do some basic IP address filtering, as well as adding a source VPC. Yep. Now, what's not very obvious here, and I think maybe we should highlight, is you can allow any AWS account access to this API. 
and you can allow any VPC endpoint access to this API. So if you've got a central VPC with a microservice and you want to share that inside your organization with multiple accounts and multiple VPCs, you add them to the resource policy and all of them can access it. So presumably you can do that across accounts that are not owned Absolutely. by the same entity as well, Completely right? with VPC peering between accounts. You don't need peering. Yeah. Oh, you don't need peering? Nope, you don't okay. need peering. Great. Because it leverages the private link technology for yep. VPC, it's available to any VPC with the correct endpoint created. Great. You know, one other recent feature that we can talk a little bit about here that I, I can't demo is that we just announced the ability for you to do uh, cross-account authorizers in Lambda. We did. Or, sorry, an API gateway uh, using Lambda functions. So one of the cool things that now you can do as an organization is, let's say that your centralized security organization wants to basically own the authentication models for your APIs. They can actually provide a centralized Lambda function that talks back to a centralized user database or yep. credential store, share that across the APIs uh, as a centralized function. And so we've heard this from enterprises for a long time. They wanted a way to apply kind of effectively a standardization for auth across the APIs. And this allows you to implement such a thing. Yeah. Great. So a bunch of interesting things here. So I've deployed this API. Let's go and get the URL for this here. Now again, I, I, I've cheated a little bit in that I already have my VPC endpoint. So I come to the VPC console real quick here. We can see that I have an endpoint that's been created. It's mapped back to the execute API service name, which represents API Gateway. Got some DNS names and some other aspects about it. It also has a security group that's been configured for it that will allow my infrastructure inside my VPC to talk to it. Now, I also have a Cloud9 uh, IDE instance up and running right now. And so here's where we're going we're going to poke at the demo gods a bit here <laughs> to see if this uh, is going to work. just elaborate a little bit more about what Cloud9 is? Oh, yeah. on the Cloud9 is a, a managed IDE that we have here at AWS, really deeply integrated with a lot of our platform, including a lot of our serverless stack, so AWS Lambda and API Gateway. And so you can do all sorts of uh, creating, writing, editing, debugging, and management of your serverless applications directly here in the console. And so the demo application or API that I created is, is called Pet Store. And so uh, that's built an API gateway. But here in my IDE, all that I'm doing is I'm just going to use the environment here to curl this API. Awesome. And so uh, for those of you here who can see my screen following along, what this did was it replied back with actually uh, an HTML response back from my API, giving me a bunch of information here. Would you humor me, Chris? Yes. So do you think we could try and do a, a host or a dig on the host name just to show the, the technical people in the audience mm -hmm. what's actually happening in that VPC? Yep, absolutely. I think I got the full name there. Cool. So I think what we can highlight here, it's hard to point to a screen on Twitch I'm learning today. Um, <laughs> but in the, if you highlight the answer section, you'll see that the IP address that came back for Execute API is actually from inside the VPC. Yep. So that IP address belongs to the VPC the customer created, and that's how we get to API Gateway. So there's no internet egress or outbound yeah. traffic leaving yeah, so the gateway. Yeah. With the so yeah. it's all my, my Cloud9 environment is inside my VPC. My API gateway is also inside my VPC. Yep. So all the traffic for this, the exception of me interfacing with the Cloud9 itself, exists inside my VPC and is private. And so, you know, again, essentially here, private APIs, easily accessible. So there's a couple of questions here on uh, Twitch from the chat, actually, Great. Chris. One of which is a personal question for you, which is, <laughs> are you going to be at serverless conf? Presumably they mean serverless conf in SF. Yes, in so serverless so conf in SF is just in a couple of weeks. You obviously got uh, fans on Twitch.tv. <laughs> so I will be there. So looking forward fans. to meet people. We've got a lot of awesome uh, <laughs> sessions going on. So looking forward to seeing everyone in San Francisco for that. Awesome. And then the second question is about versioning. So what are recommendations of best practices for handling versioning within the Amazon API gateway? How would you propose that uh, developers that are using the service yeah. do that? Yeah, so um, one of the, the simplest ways you can version within API gateway is using something called stages. Yep. And so you'll notice when Chris was deploying his API, he Slash deployed prod. to prod, yeah, right? Of course, yeah. What we'll typically see customers do is they'll have a test stage or an integration stage or a dev stage. And as you're doing your deployments, you're deploying them to those stages. Stages. Within API Gateway, when you do a deployment, what we're actually doing is we're making a read-only copy of your API configuration and then deploying it out to that stage. Yep. And so once it's deployed, it doesn't change. And so it's a great way to do versioning through those. And it's quite common to see V1 and V2 appear in those stage yeah. URLs, yeah. right? We, people we also, their apps, yeah. That's a very restful way of versioning. Yep. Um, we use something called base path mappings as the underlying feature in Gateway to do that. Yep. Yeah. 
one, one aspect real quick here to highlight about API Gateway is it is part of the serverless family that we have here at AWS. As part of that, you can have separate accounts that have API gateways in them. You can have separately provisioned API gateways. And it's a service that you don't pay for unless you're actively using it. Yep. So you pay based on the requests. And so you can stamp out dev test prod environments, different version environments. And if they're never being utilized, you're actually paying nothing for their existence. Yep. And, and they so can the, be in the same AWS account or in, in separate accounts. In the same accounts. account, in separate accounts, yeah. in same, same VPC, in separate VPCs. You're only paying it for when you're using it and putting requests yep. through it. And so in terms of dev test and the cost impact of it, one of the best services to be able to play with across proper versioning and environmenting. Yeah. I will say with the cross account features we've added in authorization in the VPC uh, connectivity, um, we see a lot of customers using multiple accounts for that. They get sort of the ultimate separation. Yep. The dev account, and they can all do everything they want in the dev account. And if they have to make a call to a resource, cross account's quite easy. And then the prod account is where the deployments happen, usually yep. with a pipeline. Yep, yeah. understand. Great, any other questions uh, that you have for our expert host, please submit those via Twitch chat. We are taking questions all day here on twitch.tv slash AWS live from the AWS Summit uh, here in New York. So is there anything uh, else that you want to cover, Chris and Dougal, before we wrap up? There was no personal shout outs to uh, me in the Twitch? No, okay. I think no, you no, you not quite as famous on it's, Twitch it's, as Chris is. Chris is, uh, good yeah. to know. Um, <laughs> so the one thing I want to talk about, if I could, is, is about the private API that you created, is the back end for that was Pet Store. Mm -hmm. Now, Pet Store is a public API. Yep. And so what Chris did there was make a public API private within the VPC. And so what we see a lot of enterprises using this feature for is exposing services that are on the internet into their VPC in a controlled manner, rather than saying, I want to get out of the VPC yeah, to so the internet. People don't have to egress. And they then, don't have to yeah. egress. They get their access logs. They get all of the controls they're used to in an AWS service. But it's still a public API that's serving that data. Yep. So. I think one other interesting thing maybe we can talk about a little bit is uh, the usage of AWS SAM in helping to deploy API gateways. So AWS SAM, serverless application models, is part of the tooling that we have around yep. serverless applications. Back maybe two months or so ago, we had a release that added a ton of capabilities to SAM for provisioning API gateways, uh, core support, private endpoint support, uh, regional endpoint support, yep. header controls, yep. tons of things now that you can yep. use if you're building a Lambda-based application uh, with API gateway. And so the, the tooling continues to get richer and richer in yeah. that space. It, it, if you're building a serverless microservice or a serverless API, SAM is hands down the easiest way and the least lines of code to do that. So you, where, you, can, uh, where can developers go if they want to learn more about SAM? Yeah. Um, you know the URL, right? Yeah, so you can find uh, in uh, github.com under AWS Labs, yep. uh, serverless-application model. If you go to the serverless resource page at aws at amazon.com slash serverless, you can find out a lot more about API Gateway, Lambda, and implementing the services. And so there's, there's a ton of information there, resources like webinars and uh, recordings from talks and all sorts of getting started guides and things that are out there. You can there. also find quite a bit of uh, serverless application building content on twitch.tv slash AWS in the video yep. on demand oh, cool. segment. We've got quite a few examples of developer advocates, mm -hmm. uh, solutions architects, and evangelists here at AWS building applications using this technology, yep. using API Gateway, using Lambda, using yeah. DynamoDB and other serverless components as well. So if you're watching on Twitch, just check out the video on demand segment for our back catalog of shows which feature uh, serverless technology, the types we're talking about here. It's a really good place to learn more. Cool. OK, great. So I think we're done for this segment. We're going to wrap this up uh, here. We will be back on twitch.tv slash AWS from the AWS Summit here in New York in just about five minutes. So stay with us for the next segment. We will see you soon. Thank, Thank you for joining us, guys. Thank Take you care, very everybody. much, Ian. Bye-bye.